What is good? We're back. We got round two. If you missed round one, go back and check that out. You should already be subscribed and, and liking all this stuff. But if you're new and just checking us out from, from the retweets, from all the great minds that we're about to hit you with on this uh, great Superflex tight end premium rookie mock. We've got some of the best in the industry here, some of the brightest minds, some of your favorites, hopefully. Uh, it was it was a whole lot of fun. We got to kind of see everybody's strategy and, you know, see kind of where some of the guys in the industry and, and, and the fork in the road for other guys in the industry are. Uh, but it was it was a whole lot of fun and a whole lot of work. Shout out to uh, Jay Wayne over there for, for editing all this. For your pleasure. One little side note. We weren't able to get Angelo on the show. Conflicting schedules. And we ran out of time. So he sent us in his picks. So we'll just cut to him. Unfortunately, we didn't get to go back and forth with our guy Angelo. But let's go ahead and jump into the second round. 2-1. And we're back with John Bauer at the Bauer Club. How you doing, man? Uh, easy 1-1 okay. easy one, one for you, but we, we managed to get a good discussion. And since maybe we went a little short on that, why don't you why don't you tell us if you had any any problems with the first round uh, before we get here into the into your pick on the second round? So we did this as what? Was it 1.5 PPR for tight ends? Yes. Yes. Uh, I, I thought Kincaid was a little bit high mm-hmm. at 107. I don't even know who took him there. So this Bull is an, an, a, who was it? The dynasty Zoltan. All right, all right. So was the, not an attack on the Zoltan. Uh, <laughs> yeah, don't mess with him. He doesn't mind. Yeah, you don't. Want to don't mess don't mess with the Zoltan. <laughs> uh, but 107, I thought was a little bit early for Kincaid, especially in 1.5 PPR. I personally, uh, I I see it was Jeff that that took Quentin at 108. I would have taken Addison if it were me. I have him in a tier above Quentin Johnston, but then Zay. A chain, uh, some lunatic took Will Levis at one twelve. <laughs> I don't know who that was. Getting awful risky. No, but I mean, at, at that point in the draft, I mean, I'm looking at it starting in at one twelve. I have Levis in this tier, you know, so yeah. he's going to get a shot eventually. I know we don't love the the second round draft capital, but it's a small sample size overall of players that have been taken right. in the second round of the NFL draft at the quarterback position. Um, is he going to get meaningful snaps here in year one? Maybe, maybe not. Maybe not. But yeah. I mean, all of these guys, even the guy I'm taking here at 201, there's risk there. Yeah. So if if even if you don't love Will Levis, but you just feel okay about him. I yeah, think that's, that's perfectly I, fine. I, don't, I, don't, I can't, I'm not going to jump all over you for the, it's just, it's a quarterback and I think he'll get a shot and he already has okay value in startup drafts. It's not mm-hmm. anything crazy, but it's not bad. Um, and we, we know the state of quarterbacks right now. And, you know, there's a, there's kind of like you were talking about with the running backs, like the good ones have, have you know, kind of separated a little bit. And then there's a lot of guys in the middle. I know Mitch is a, is a proponent of that. It's, you know, it's, easy to cut or hard to trade away some of those middle quarterbacks that are even still pretty productive but you can't really get much value for him at least levis maybe has a little intrigue with some unknown and some legs and you know potentially taking that over but i'm not crazy about him but two one here uh interesting pick i guess i think everybody's that we talked to is mostly on board with this so what was your thoughts here at two one so like i said about will levis being in this tier in 1.5 PPR, I have five guys lumped together. And looking at the draft capital, looking at the profile, the body of work in college, and the the positional potential uh, in the 1.5 PPR for tight ends, I opted to go with a running back, and that is Zach Charbonnet. The landing spot, absolute garbage from a a very quick glance right you sure. have a second round running back that people Kenneth are, walker's so good I, he's good he's good yeah. all right but you you have you have zach charbonnet if you told me and i thought he was going to go in the second round but if you guaranteed me hey jb zach charbonnet is going to go in the second round of the nfl draft i would say we're looking at top 12 dynasty running back guys yeah but he goes to a backfield where they just took Kenneth Walker in the second round last year. He was a top five dynasty running back from a value perspective. I think that's changed a little bit now mm. because of Charbonnet, not too much, but a little bit. But Zach Charbonnet instantly, not only does he have standalone value 
in an offense that, I mean, just a year ago, everybody's sitting here, myself included, saying this Seattle offense, there's no touchdown upside. It's going to be horrendous. But now we saw what Geno Smith, DK Metcalf, Tyler Lockett, Kenneth Walker, Noah Fan did last year. You add JSN, you add Zach Charbonnet, and I think there's going to be touchdown upside. We're going to see some involvement in the passing game. And uh, Zach Charbonnet is a player that's going to have standalone flex play appeal on a weekly basis. But if anything were to happen to Kenneth Walker, Zach Charbonnet is probably the most valuable running back to on a team across the board, in my opinion. So for me, Zach Charbonnet, too much upside. I'm taking him at 201. Yeah, what a what a title, Zach Charbonnet. Too much upside. Too I'd much get some upside. clicks. No, Kendra Miller thoughts here. I th- I think I, I I still like Charbonnet a good bit for a lot of the reasons that you mentioned, but no no thoughts with for Kendra here. Uh, for me, and I know it, it's taking me back to last year. Jay, what am I going to say? Draft capital. The receiving that was pretty pro- good. Re- it was good, but the receiving profile. I had more college receptions than Kendra Miller. I think uh, well, you know, it wasn't terrible. I don't think could have been uh, that bad. Might, might it, have been like it was and, low. It, it was wasn't low, Kenneth but, Walker bad, right? That Kenneth Walker. Oh man! But let me say, let me say, <laughs> I have Kendra Miller in the same tier. All okay. right. Um, there was just so much unknown in New Orleans. You bring in Jamal Williams, who we saw not necessarily the most efficient back, but if he gets the volume, and I think he's going to be a volume dependent back there in New Orleans, certainly going to vulture some touchdowns from Alvin Kamara if he plays the entire season uh, in, in getting that goal line work. But with Alvin Kamara, I don't know. I mean, nobody knows. Is there going to be a suspension this year? What's going to happen with that contract beyond 2023? Um and and something to keep in mind too. Let's say they they would move on from Alvin Kamara. You have Jamal Williams. You have Kendra Miller. The free agent class next year, it's almost exactly the same as it was this year with all the guys getting franchise tag. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, so many talented running backs. The the puzzle pieces are going to be moving around every which way. We have strong rookie running backs again. You know, broken record. Uh, we say it every single off season, but coming into the league next year, so there's really no guarantee that. Even without Alvin Kamara, Kendra Miller would get a workhorse type role. With all of that said, I think uh, who Ray GQ took him. Ray took him at two hundred six. Yeah, uh, that's a smash for me at two hundred six. Yeah, I want to say he is one of my most rostered rookies actually, and it's because that if I'm sitting there at two hundred eight, two hundred nine, and maybe I have another late second, I've been very aggressive moving up to get certain players. Kendra Miller, Tank Bigsby, those running backs in that range. So this is an anti-Kendra, but like I said, Zach Charbonnet, there's just so much upside there. Yeah. Well, for the sake of time, I won't. <laughs> with my with my Kendra uh, argument, because uh, we'll, we'll talk about him many times, and we have already. Um, so, But no no mayor, though, in tight end premium? Two PP. So for me, mayor is in the tier above in two PPR. Same in 1.75 PPR and 1.5, he drops the same tier for me. So, you know, depending on roster construction, depending on league dynamic, how tight are different managers in the league when it comes to tight ends, you know, you go in some leagues and it's going to cost you a left not to get a tight end, you know? <laughs> so if that's the situation and Mayer's on the board, same tier for me, I would be perfectly fine with Mayer there. So let's say Kendra goes 111 and then you're faced with... A chain or Charbonnet at two one. I'm going A chain. Okay. All right. I just want to see where we were at here. I mean, didn't you see Jeff Wilson's comments today? <laughs> that that yeah, dude what can a, fly. Yeah. What an enlightened statement that was. <laughs> like, yeah, yeah, bro. We know. We know. Um, if, no, he, but if I, he couldn't, he'd be Deuce Vaughn. Like we're, we'd be we'd be shuffling right, him right. down to the fourth round. A chain's one of the guys that that the floor is so low could you know get wrecked week one <laughs> you know the the size the mm-hmm. the weight obviously a little bit of a concern even though i've talked about this several times his bmi is higher than several running backs who you look back at you know uh LaShawn mccoy jamal charles uh am i saying he is those guys maybe maybe <laughs> but you know i think his size might be a little bit overblown when it comes in you know 
BMIs mixed in, but I I like A chain. I like yeah, them. yeah, I, I can't I can't fight with you there. It puts the fun back in fantasy, that's for sure. I'm yeah. throwing I, I would I would, for me, Kendra would be the only running back I'm taking in the first round outside of Gibbs and Bijan. Um so I'd throw him kind of up in that spot and then sharp between Charbonnet and A chain I'm you know, that's a, that's a tough call for me, but I think I might I might lean a chain a little. So I'm I'm mostly with you there, except for the Kendry slander. Um, I love Kendry. <laughs> I do. Twelve and sixteen catches in his uh, in his it's two the, seasons. It's the market share, KC. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. I like I'll, that impersonation, the impression right there. <laughs> um, no thoughts on Mingo or Laporta. Laporta, I. I have him in so again i wish we'd have done two ppr yeah can i just say i wish we'd have done two ppr yeah, i mean you're allowed to say whatever you want i let you, you i let you talk about kendra in a bad way <laughs> so i <I'm... laughs> um no mingo another one that the the question marks in that wide receiver room in carolina i mean i know they have adam thiel and they have dj shark terrace marshall but Mingo could really stand out and develop quite a, yeah. a rapport with Bryce Young there for a, an offense that needs playmakers. And you have Frank Reich, who is, I think, the type of coach a team like that needs. You know, um, so I, I mean, you're talking to me in the same tier. I have Charbonnet, yeah. Andre Miller, okay. Jonathan Mingo, Levis, and Michael Mayer. And then I have Laporta in the one right below with it being 1.5 PPR. Yeah, I was just I'm just feeling yeah. We haven't talked about rookies in a while. I'm trying to you know. I know it's been a few you know. weeks. I got to collect some intel. We're in a league together. I don't know you know. I need, at least need to try to get an advantage somewhere. My so. team is ass in that league. You guys <laughs> have plenty of an advantage. <laughs> well, I mean, we we both took teams over, so it's you know, we don't need to be embarrassed of those teams. <laughs> You know, um, all right, man. We'll we'll catch up with you at uh, at three one. Oh, real quick before we go, let me where can we find everything? We get so chummy, you know, we're friends. I, I gotta forget that, you know. Yeah, find me at the Bauer Club on Twitter. Uh, one of the hosts of Dynasty Theory at Dynasty Theory FF on Twitter and Instagram. We got the Discord, we got the Patreon, and then I'll give a shout out to my co host Mitch Sorensen at Dino MC and Dan Lamagna at FF Coach Dan. Uh, two great guys I've been working with for. I mean, it feels like too long because time stands still when you get to hang out with your, you know, best friends. I think you two can understand that, right? Yeah. Oh, mm, sure. Sure. We even live uh, two blocks away from each other, so it's even worse than. What you uh, if I live that close to Mitch and Dan, one of us would be dead. I think. <laughs> I don't. I'm not even sure if Dan's real because I've never, <laughs> I've never seen him. <laughs> he I, get met, I met him to in our the parties. Flesh. I met <laughs> him in the flesh. <laughs> He may have been a cyborg, but he was there. <laughs> All right. All right. We'll see you at 3 1. We're back with Matt Hicks at the 2 2 here. What were you thinking, kind of leading up to this, hoping for? And then who'd you take? Man, sprinting to the podium to hand in the card here. Michael Mayer at 202. Uh, we got a premium going on here at the sure. tight end position. This is just an absolute steal. I am thrilled to get him at 202. I'm willing to take Michael Mayer as high as 108 in a non-premium league. You know, once you get past, in my opinion, that 106, 107 mini tier. Um, I like Dalton Kincaid. You know, I have Dalton Kincaid highly rated, but Michael Mayer is still my tight end one. He's a great pass catcher, great contested catch. Uh, I think he plugs in really well projection wise into the Vegas offense. I think he's going to have great red zone opportunity and he's going to get on the field right away. Cause he is a two way tight end. He can smash. He can block. I really like his fit with Jimmy G in terms of a, a quick impact. I have him projected as a borderline tight end one. Now granted a borderline sure. tight end one isn't a, isn't a high, you know, marker to hit necessarily, but still a really good player to have uh, in the back end of the first round for me. So to get him at two Oh two and a premium, Oh man, I'm psyched about it. Yeah, I, I've I really like your draft so far. Those, those are two guys that I'm I'm locked into Richardson and, and then Mayer here. So a, a pretty strong start for you. It seemed like you know the community as a whole is a, a little down on Mayer, and most of the guys we talked to were seemed like they were a little down on Mayer. Now some of those guys are just straight up. I'm never drafting a rookie tight end. I'll just buy him later. Which I mean, whatever. But you know, I I, I tend to agree, man. I, once we get anywhere past probably like 110 for me um or 19ish I'm I'm all in on Mayer man like I don't 
I don't see that much of a difference between the two. Obviously, I know their play style, Kincaid and Mayer, is 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 a good bit different. But I really like Mayer, and just because he didn't go in the first round and didn't test off the charts, I'm I'm not willing to to downplay him, and it didn't really seem like you were either. Yeah, I mean, if you look at Mayer, right, and, you know, maybe it's a blessing and a curse that, you know, I've been following him since he was a freshman in college, but this guy has led the Notre Dame offense in receiving since his true freshman season. And if you're familiar with the Notre Dame offense, they don't like going through the tight end position and they do not like giving high volume to freshmen. But Mayer was that special of a prospect. He has been their passing offense for three years in a row. So I think because, you know, we went to the combine, we didn't see super athletic testing, you know, the general, you know, there's always an ADP shift, right? When you don't put up that mega athletic testing numbers, but I don't think we need that from the tight end position, right? To have high level production. Um, And the other thing for me is draft capital. I don't put a draft capital break at the first round. I do um, 20 uh, picks, 21 to 50 are all in the same range because I take it from a NFL front office scouting perspective. And from what I've uh, gathered, that's a tier break for them. And so mayor and Kincaid for me, exact same draft capital valuation. So, you know, just cause he slipped a little into the second round, just cause he went after Sam Laporta, it doesn't actually affect anything in my process. So would, no consideration of Laporta over Mayer. What? No, no. And I love that Laporta is getting this hype. Like he was kind of like my sleeper tight end going into the draft. I kept telling everybody he was going top 50. I wasn't getting a lot of positive <laughs> feedback on that take. And now everybody's into him and I'm, I'm all about it. He's such a fun player. I loved him at Iowa. He was the Iowa offense. That was a pouring offense. If you're watching yeah. Iowa football, man. Um, and so he's super creative. He's athletic. I like uh, Sam Laporta a lot. I'm going to get a good exposure to him, but I want to get that exposure, you know, 205 or, or later um, and, and definitely after Michael Mayer. And what, what would be the one player here that would make you think twice about not taking Mayer at, at 2-2? Would, would there be a player left that had to fall that far or is it pretty much that's that's it? Yeah, I'm looking at who's on the board, and this is the guy I want. You know, I I got Zach Charbonnet taken one above me. You know, Charbonnet would definitely be in the conversation in a non-premium league. Uh, But in the premium, man, it wasn't even close for me. You know, it was one of those... I, 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 you know, I'm looking at the draft. I'm doing a double take to make sure I'm seeing (laughs) that he's still available for me. So it was a pretty easy one. Yeah, I I think so too, man. You've had it it pretty easy through two rounds, uh, and I, you know... I'm, I'm excited about your draft. So uh, where can we find all your work? Uh, and then we'll catch you at three, two. Yeah, man. Rookie big board on YouTube, whatever podcast provider that you're listening to patreon.com slash rookie big board. That's the discord, the rankings, all the good stuff, rookie analysis all year round at the two, three, this is kind of when I like to target guys like Jonathan Mingo, Michael Mayer, Zach Charbonnet, and they went in that order actually. 2 1 with Charbonnet, 2 2 Mayer, and I'm sitting at 2 3. And I like Jonathan Mingo quite a bit in this Panthers offense due to the simple fact they don't have a number one receiver there. DJ Chark, Adam Thielen, Terrace Marshall's a nice secondary, tertiary piece, but a guy like Jonathan Mingo being drafted as high as he was has a chance to slot in there and be the number one guy come year end, right? Do you have a couple guys on some smaller contracts dealing in shark who might not be there long-term. So a guy like Jonathan Mingo might be the answer long-term for Bryce Young to kind of grow into having a number one primary target like Jonathan Mingo. We like the size, the 6'2", 220 pounds, good mover, get with the ball in his hand, and he's underrated when the ball's in the air. I think he's going to be a definite asset for that offense for years to come, and I wouldn't be shocked if you know you could you take him early, you know, early in the second round, 2-1, two, 2-2, two, two, or 2-3. Two, I think that's a good slot for him to go, especially in tight end premium. All right, we're back with Garrett Price at 2-4. Uh, what do you think here? Who's who's the pick? So I there's a group chat that goes, you know, when we're doing this this mock draft. And I know the questions coming of like, what pick did you not like? And <laughs> look, I know all the hate. There's probably people listening to this right now. They're like, you took Ty J Spears at 2-4? What? Don't you know about his knees? Like, Oh. Didn't you learn anything from Zamir White? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what are you thinking, you idiot? Look, I've heard it all on Twitter about how you can't draft him because he doesn't have an ACL, which 
first of all, real quickly, I, I spoke to a couple of people. The MRIs, first of all, for people to say that he doesn't have an ACL, MRIs are wrong like 35% of the time. They don't even pick these things up. So that's first of all. So I don't even know if that's 100% true. I haven't seen that like verified anywhere. But on top of that, all I need to know is that the Tennessee Titans were confident enough in his medicals to take him in the third round. Correct. And it's like, not like he tore his ACL in the end of last season. He It was before last season. Right. And if you watch him, it doesn't look like there's a problem with his knees. Now, I get that there could be some long-term concern, sure. but the people that are mad about this are the same people to say that you can't take a – you, you got to sell the running back before they get on their second contract. So if you're only looking at a three-year, four-year window anyways, then what's the difference, you know? My man is electric out there. Exactly. Like the and, and for me, I – granted, I'm a huge fan of his game. Like, I loved watching his tape. It was truly a joy to watch. Mm-hmm. Right. I had him just a hair below Gibbs. Like, he was my running back three in this class. I thought he was that dynamic. There were rumblings that – he would have gone a lot higher had the medicals been better. Like he would have been a second round pick in this draft as opposed to a third round if the medicals had been a little bit better. So and then you you factor in because the other thing that I've heard a lot is, well, here's the next Darrington Evans and Hilliard and you know all these guys. Well, sure, they didn't pan out very well. One, I don't think they were anywhere close to as talented as Spears. No, Mm-mm. that's but two, Derrick Henry wasn't 29 and in the last year of his deal at that point either. Right. So and been shopped on the trade market as well. Exactly. So look, I get that there's there's some hate. I know that Spears is falling at times to the third round. Somebody even tweeted me a board where he fell to the fourth, which is Ooh, ridiculous no to me. Way. Yeah, it, it seems league. absurd. You get better NFL draft capital than you do in your rookie draft. I don't get yeah. it. But <laughs> well, all of that being said, like if if I had the ability, I probably would trade back to like two nine, two ten and get him there. But we can't trade in here. So at that point, I wanted to make sure I got my guy. I wanted to make sure that I got Spears because talent wise, I, I think the world of the kid. Yeah. And the situation, you know, that I mean, shit, their receiving core is is not, you know, plump with with options either. No. So he could he, go right in and carve out a nice little uh, receiving role as well right in there. So. You know, different GM, maybe moving in a little bit different direction of how they're going to approach things. Uh, I always like kind of how the Titans don't give a shit what everybody else thinks and does. (laughs) and They kind of do their own thing and still manage to, you know, win a decent amount of ball games. So would that be your typical move? If you have a two four and you were able to trade, you would you would be interested in moving down because the likelihood of Spears being there. You're just if you if he's there at two four, you're just taking them. Uh, It depends on who I'm drafting with. I'm trying to be like cognizant of like, does somebody else really like him too? Because if I need to, I'll take him here. I have no problem taking him, you know, early to mid second. Like that's, that's fine by me. But I will say in every draft that I've done, I've not had to take him this early. I've been able, like, I think the earliest I've, I've seen him go other than this, other than like me drafting him super high was uh, two (laughs) seven was the highest I saw him go. So I probably would have traded back a few spots, maybe got a little bit of extra draft capital next year or, you know, a third round pick or something like that to spice things up a little bit. But I have is no it, problem taking them here. Is there anyone that went in front of him that, that if they had fall into two, four, you did, you did take them over Spears. Like in the last, like um, say, say Charbonnet through bingo. No, no, I, uh, I do like Jonathan Mingo quite a bit. He would have been tempting for sure. Uh, Cause I do really, I really liked his tape. I liked the landing spot in Carolina. Yeah. So I, I thought that was a really good pick there, but no, I, I still think that Spears would have been the top guy for me. Uh, you know, knowing that I had to pick at two, four, I think, I think I would have gone him over Charbonnet over mayor and over Mingo. And do you, do you lean towards, Running backs in a rookie draft, or it just so happens he's the 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 best player available on the board, and it doesn't really matter. Yeah, that's that's where I get I'm at. I I just take the guy that I think is the the truly the best player on the board. If I walk out of a draft with four running backs, and I walk out with four running backs. If I walk out with four quarterbacks, I walk out with four quarterbacks. So, uh, and even you know, slight like hint to the next pick, like that was kind of the thing there for me. Where it was like it's best player available, so that's where we're gonna go. So, uh, yeah, but but. Typically, I'm just best available guy. 
Real quick thoughts on tight end though. Are you still you down to draft a rookie tight end? Because a lot of people are like, can't do that. Get oh yeah, next I, year. Get him cheaper next year. Oh no, I have no no problem. I've taken Dalton Kincaid at like one nine in some drafts. All right, and, all right. Uh, you know, I have I have no pro, especially if it's tight end premium. Mm-hmm. Uh, I have no problem doing some of that kind of stuff. So no thought of Laporta there though, just because because Spears is is your guy. Laporta was a little bit tempting. I'm not gonna lie. I did slightly consider Laporta there, but no, it was it was always Spears. He was always the one. All right. Well, we'll have to see who you're talking about on the next pick, and 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 we'll catch you there. Sounds good. All right. We're back at two five with Corey. Uh, what were you thinking here? And, and before we get going, tell us where we can uh, we'll find you at. Yeah, find me over on YouTube, Fantasy Stock Exchange. Just closing in on twenty k. Like I said, get him over twenty um, k. <laughs> Yeah, let's let's get let's get it over there. And and Do this it. one was a, a pretty easy pick for me because he said he had models over there. I don't know. I don't know what he <laughs> <Yeah>. meant. <by laughs> I'm I, I'm married, you know. Um. Yeah, no, no, the nerd kind of models, not the good, not oh, the uh, not the kind that you guys. So I don't, I don't know how I feel about models, but yeah. All right, sorry. Get your get yours, girl. What were you thinking at two five here? <laughs> I mean, when we're talking nerd kind of models, Josh Downs sticks out in a lot of them, which is the guy that I Perfect. that I, I went with here at the two five. Not the uh, not the um, the best looking profile from a size perspective at, you know, five foot nine, 171 pounds. He weighed out at the combine. But if this dude was six foot two, 200 pounds, he had one of the most ironclad profiles you're going to see out of a rookie wide receiver. He posted like a 38 percent target share his sophomore year with Sam Howell, who's basically the only guy he could trust in that offense at North Carolina. And then of course, Drake may takes over this year and he still has another productive season. Matt Harmon charted him really well for reception perception, thought he was, you know, high, high level winner against contested catch situations. Despite that size, he's plays like one of the biggest receivers in this class. And even though he projects to just be a slot there in Indianapolis, I think with Anthony Richardson coming in, knowing that he's not the most well-developed passer yet, he needs an easy target to hit. And while Pittman's the best receiver on that team, he's a harder target to get the ball to for Richardson as a young quarterback. Josh Downs wins early and often off the line of scrimmage in the slot. He can give Richardson some early completions. And I think schematically, he makes a lot of sense to fill, you know, the 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 over the middle kind of role for Shane Steich. And I, I love Josh Downs in rookie drafts right now for me. Neck and neck and neck was Quentin Johnston, Josh Downs, and Zay Flowers before the draft. And now, because those guys went in the first round, you definitely give them a little bit of a bump. But now, Josh Downs is falling so far Mm -hmm. in rookie drafts because he went in the third round because he went to Indianapolis Colts, probably won't throw the ball very much, that he's become easily the biggest value. I don't even think many people would have taken him this high. I think he belongs to go this high. I've seen him go late in the second round, early in the third round in some cases. I, I would I was interested to see where he would fall here. And then you took him at two five and I was like, damn, I kind of wanted to see how much further he might fall with all these uh, guys that we have in here. Where um, how how much further up would you be willing? Were you taking him at two one? I would have taken him very easily over Mingo and Spears for sure. OK, but Mayer and Charbonnet give you a little more pause. Yeah, Charbonnet and Mayer were high level prospects for me before the draft. And, you know, especially in like any kind of tight end premium format, I think you could definitely take both tight ends over Josh Downs. But for me, as soon as Charbonnet and A-Chain were off the board, as well as Will Levis and uh, the two tight ends, I think uh, Downs is my next ranked player. I I would take him over, you know, Roshan, Kendra, whatever running back you have next. Mm. And I would take him over Mingo, who I know got better draft capital, but was clearly an inferior prospect in my opinion what's your thoughts on mingo i've been trying to pick everybody's brain a little bit because he's kind of he's tough for me to place like i'm i'm having a hard time really getting a hold of you know i feel like it's got to at least be the second half of the second round for me to have any interest in mingo um what's your yeah thoughts on him? i uh i put a thread out on my twitter if you want to follow me over there at football stock it's pinned on my profile right now so if you look at that thread I basically did a study, a breakdown of like 15 plus PPR point per game wide receivers. And you look at the traits that these guys had based on their college production, based on their size, their speed, athleticism, whatever you want to test. The things that matter most for wide receivers are production based metrics. And Mingo didn't produce very much in college. And the things that mattered least for those high level producers at wide receiver were things like size and athleticism, which is basically where Mingo has gotten most of his pub because he's a Mm -hmm. big receiver. He ran fast. He wears number one for Ole Miss. (laughs) So people think he looks like A.J. Brown. He's he's got some fun tape and he's got some traits for sure. But I think he's a far too risky proposition at the point in drafts where he's going right now. 
Yeah, I, 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 I agree. I got to push him, push him back a little bit there. If you were at like two ten and say you get to two six and Downs is there, is that an immediate like two? You send in two twos. What's what's like the 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 first stab at, at going up to get your Downs? Yeah, I mean, I would depend on the room because at two ten, I might just sit there and see if he falls. Because <laughs> okay. I got shares of him in a lot of rookie yeah. drafts in the late second round, so I might not even be too, uh, totally willing to go up unless it's like not that big of a move up. If I could go up for a second and a future third or something like that, I'd probably do it. But um, yeah, for me, I, I found that he's falling to the to the mid yeah. to late second round most of the time. So he's one of those players. I think just by perception because he's small and he went to the Colts and he went in the third round, people are not going to like jump all over him. It's not like you know somebody else falling might cause everybody to try and trade up. I don't think downs is that type of guy. And I, I'm just, he's literally one of the, my highest drafted players yeah. in all my rookie drafts. You, you kind of alluded to it at the end of your initial rant with downs. There are, is, do you think he may be somebody that coming halfway through the season, maybe somebody you could even double down on it at, at, where you didn't get them because there could be a slow start to how they move, how maybe how they're, you know, maybe, maybe they are a little bit more run forward, just trying to iron some kinks out, get Richardson comfortable. You, do you, one, does that worry you at all about the role moving forward? And two, is that you know, going to take an opportunity to double down as much as you can? And maybe not being able to get on the field in two wide receiver sets as, as a slot guy that he is too, has, has been a concern. Yeah, yeah. I mean, if the peripherals are all fine, like if we get to week 10 and he's got like a 29% targets per route run or something like that. And, you know, he's maybe not, like you said, on the field in two wide receiver sets. And, you know, Richardson can't really complete any passes at this point in time. He's just basically running like Justin Fields did last year. I, I think, yeah, I would definitely be willing to da double down on Josh Downs. My, I like this archetype of wide receiver has been something that I've gravitated towards. Um, before because I watched the film with these guys and I know this guy can play. I know he's small. I know he's a slot receiver, but Elijah Moore is a small slot receiver who can play. And Jahan Dotson was a small receiver who can play as well. And I was way beyond market value on those guys. And I mean, Moore's had a little bit of struggles because of the Zach Wilson situation, but I still think both of those guys are great receivers. Yeah, no, I, I, I like both of those guys. I, I like downs a good bit. I, I, I've been liking the slide. I didn't, I didn't love him as much as you did as having him up there with those guys. I definitely did have him as, you know, after those top four guys, when it was downs kind of all day. And I, but I do like the fact that he's kind of usually in the middle of that second round. It makes me feel a whole lot better of, of, uh, of the taking the swing, but it's nice to hear, uh, somebody is still loud and proud with the downs, uh, uh, that didn't sound great, um, but uh, appreciate the uh, the insight there. And we'll, we'll catch you at three, five, two, six. We're back with Ray GQ. Tell us where we can find all your work at before we get going here. Yeah, you can catch me on Twitter at Ray GQ. That's Q U E. And then find everything that we do on YouTube at Destination Devi. All right, right. So you're sitting on the clock here at two, six. I personally would be elated if this yeah. was my pick. But what were you thinking here? I was pretty happy. I was pretty <laughs> happy here uh, at two six. You know, watching uh, a chain come off of the board and Charbonnet. I knew there was no chance that he'd make it. Um, you know, seeing um, Mayer come off of the board, and I was pretty excited to see Josh Downs go right right ahead of me, uh, leaving me with uh, one of my favorite running backs in this class. Definitely was top five for me. I think when it was all said and done, he was Kendra Miller was four RB four RB four five for me in this class. Uh, but to get him him here at the two six spot, I think it's incredible. You know, I have um, I, I've I've kind of evolved how I rank and proceed with running backs. And it, it's interesting because when I started off doing this, it was a lot of film. It was film and college scouting. And as time has gone on, I understand that I can save some time with some, some metrics. There's some data out there that I can use that can kind of give me the answer. And it's back to historically long story short um, <laughs> with, with the, with the running, with the running back position, man, like I, I think we really need to be thinking about these guys in categories, right? Not all these running backs are the same. You know, you look at, the size and the prototype of running backs that are truly uh, considered three down backs in the NFL today. It, it doesn't look like Devon A chain, like betting on him to do that um, is just suboptimal. But when you look at Kendra Miller, he does fit the profile of if there were going to be a workhorse type running back who can handle 60% of their team snaps, 
it's Kendra Miller at his size. Uh, we didn't get the testing numbers on him, but to land in New Orleans, Alvin Kamara's situation legally and contractually long term is kind of up in the air. You bring in Jamal Williams, who's good, but uh, you know, even if it's not full throttle for Kendra this year, I think this is a player that I would like to have on my rosters moving forward. He's a he's a good running back, and I really like the spot. Yeah, I, I would agree. So you're saying if Charbonnet was there, you would for sure take Charbonnet over yeah. Kendra? I would have taken Charbonnet over Kendra. I would not have taken Tajay Spears over either of those guys. An A-chain? Uh, would you have taken A-chain? or? He's thinking. He is the one, and I've said it all. Pro- I said it all draft process. He's the one that was going to put people's process to a test mm-hmm. because I thought that he would get the capital, and if he hit a sweet landing spot, Woo! that would be the one where people are like, "God, I know he's only one eighty eight, but fire him up." <laughs> here's the thing: it historically, is still probably a very awful bet. But damn, I just want to try. Like, I just, I just want to see if he could be good. So. I probably would have taken a chain over Kendra. It wouldn't have been the right process play, but if he is good, man, he's probably going to be really good and really mm-hmm. efficient. Yeah, the landing spot was 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 pretty decent. For already him put the, on some good. weight too, right? He already put on a little bit of weight. Yeah, that's, that's what they're saying. But so putting the so phone back time, in fantasy, baby. That's one of the maps, baby. A <laughs> chain, another one. The last time you picked. Kincaid went right after you and, you know, spoiler alert, uh, Laporta goes right after you. Is there any thought of taking the tight end here now that we're in the second round? No, I'm good, man. No, <laughs> absolutely <laughs> not. <laughs> it's one time. It's one five, man. I'm not taking like I'm looking at who went after Sam Laporta and I'm not taking. Yeah, I'm taking a couple of these cats that went after him before before Sam Laporta. One point five doesn't move the needle when you start looking at a tight end target share in Detroit. It's just not good. So. All right, Good so luck with that one. Let's say let's say Kendra is unavailable here, and the rest of the guys who are still on the board are available. Who would have been your next choice of guys after this? Man, real talk, knowing what I know today, Tank Bigsby looks pretty attractive back there at the two twelve spot, and then Marvin Mims also at two eleven. I really like that spot in Denver. I like the fact that that's their first pick. They moved up to get the kid, Sean Payton. Um, I I would have definitely had those two in consideration. Roshan, I like him, but I don't think I would have taken him there. Yeah. It probably would have been Tank right now. Uh, the sentiment and feeling I have, it feels like Tank Bigsby wouldn't be a bad bet. All the all the chatter with him and ETN supposed supposedly split and work. So probably Bigsby. And would you? Which you know, I don't know. That was a great pick by whoever picked that guy. I mean, uh, <laughs> strong pick. Uh, uh, would you? So you, if you see Miller starting to fall a little bit there, like let's say you see Mingo go at two three, do you try to move up two spots to try to grab him there, or are you just sitting tight and hoping that he falls? Nah, man. I think you can sit tight. I think you can sit tight. I think there's um. You know, there's enough hype and enthusiasm around a couple of these other guys, and especially now with, you know, Rasheed Rice in Kansas City and Bigsby and Mims. Like, I think you, I think now, opposed to when we did this, you might be able to catch Kendra a little bit later in some spots, mm. right? You know, Jaden Reed's getting pumped up every other day that yeah, I'm looking on, yeah. on, on Twitter. So uh, I think it just, it truly depends on the format and, um, the biggest variable in X factor is know your league, right? right. How, how does your league respond to these kind of assets? Yeah, it was kind of surprising to me to see kind of this group of guys and, and Mims fall a little down there. I thought with this group that you would see Mims go a little earlier there. Yeah, same. I mean, that's why I'm just like, damn, that, those two picks in particular, like when I scan the second round, my eyes go right there to 211 and 212. Mm-hmm. Like it goes right there, you know? Um, the real question is, is, too 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 high for mayor in a two-point perception league absolutely not um you know that'd be awesome if you can get uh, michael mayor at that two two spot so two points per reception or have to start two tight end mayor's probably a first round pick for me so you, you're you're still not fucking with mayor at two two and one five and one no, point five. Oh man no all right no. he's a, he's we found another anti-tight end guy no, can't so you're it. right right now you're looking at the dynasty zoltan's draft and and you're, <laughs> you're calling him the, you're calling him the fish right now right man i'm feeling good picking before and like, after him yeah. man i'm feeling good all right 
Um, so do you do you have a particular like obviously it's not tight end, but like when you get into rookie drafts, do you target running backs more? Do you target wide receivers more? What do you or is it just st- strictly value based on kind of how it's going? Uh, well, uh, I I'd probably say like ninety seven percent of my portfolio is dynasty best ball, mm-hmm. um, and it just philosophically changes how you roster construct. So you actually would rather have a bunch of receivers, you know what I mean? And not Mm -hmm. a lot of zeros. So I just wouldn't have a lot of interest in some of these running backs. And on the lineup league, there is value to the backup running backs. So I would like to have the, you know, the Eric Gray's and, uh, and, and those guys. So um, it, for me, it really truly just depends on the format. So in best ball, I'm, I want all the Jalen Hyatt's and the tank Dells and the Michael Wilson's give me all the receivers who are probably going to hit my flex lineup more times than a, a backup running back and at least score me points, have an opportunity to score me points. So lineup league final rounds for me, high Raz tight ends or any running back that can make a 53. And then, you know, I'm very much like Scott. I've learned my lesson (laughs) Uh, after about the second round, like any receiver after that, I'm very hesitant on spending high capital on. So uh, just depends on the format, man. Yeah. All right. Well, on these next two picks, you've been throwing some shade at the tight end. So I'm excited to get into those. So we'll, (laughs) uh, we'll see, we'll see you at three, six. All right. Well, we're back at the two seven. Had a nice little tight end conversation with with our guy Mike. Where can we where can we find you, uh, Mr. Mike? Yeah, uh, you can find me at Dynasty Zoltan FF uh, on Twitter, um, as well as uh, the Dynasty Zoltan podcast and uh, a uh, Patreon uh, subscription under the same name. Excellent. Um, so we had a we took Kincaid on your first pick. Mm-hmm. Back to two seven here. Uh, what were your thoughts leading up to this? Were you bummed about any picks that went off the board? And then who'd you take? You know, a little bit. I I have a clear top 18 in the class. So um, I I find both the 1-7 and the 2-7 inflection points. I I think there's a clear top six and a clear top 18. That 18 to me, they don't go off the board 100% of the time like the top six does. It's more about, you know, 30% of the time just because there's way more variance there. Um, But there was one player in my top 18 who was still left on the board, and that was Sam Laporta. Uh, pretty happy to get him. If this was a class where I was able to trade up, I would have probably, you know, traded up to the 206 beforehand. But once Tajay Spears went off the board at the 204, who's my guy who I have in the back of the second round, I knew I'd get Sam Laporta or one of those guys at the 207. Yeah. So, so another tight end here. And if this was, you know, are you, you're comfortable with coming out of the rookie draft, spending your two top picks on, on tight ends? Yeah, yeah, totally comfortable with it. I, I, I think both are relatively high t- floor tight ends. I mean, Laporta, if you want to talk about his potential in Detroit, it is just a perfect fit for him. I mean, not that he's going to be TJ Hawkinson, but to be quite honest, I don't think TJ Hawkinson's that talented. And the the role in Detroit is clearly just massive, and they have absolutely no one. It's probably the worst positional depth chart in the NFL before this pick. <laughs> and Laporta comes in as a very productive tight end out of college, and really there's no reason that he can't soak up 50 targets in year one. Right. If you're going to helmet scout a tight end, that's this is where to do it from Iowa. And Yeah. And- you know, I, I would disagree. I think the Hawkins is a pretty talented dude. I just, he can't really stay healthy and they didn't want to play that game anymore. So they shipped him out to get something. And then they bring in this dude who is almost like equally as fun to watch. Like the yeah. dude is so much fun to watch. He plays all over the place. He's yakking it up. You know, it's a, it's a pretty exciting pick. Great draft capital. You know, I, I, I don't think you can go wrong taking Sam LaPorta here in the second round. No, and and especially at the two seven, where my other yeah. choices are. I mean, if you look at the few picks after me, it's Rashi Rice, who just I I thought was one of the worst receivers on film I've seen in a very long time. Like Ooh. he basically played like an old school power forward, but he's six one, like like a Julius Randall. He'd just post guys up on the block, and he he would do well. He'd make some good contested catches, but he wasn't getting open at all. Um, like looking at, for instance, uh, Matt Harmon's perception reception, I think he was in the ninth percentile or worse against every type of coverage. So not interested in a guy like him. And and then you have these second round receivers in Jaden Reed and Marvin Mims who haven't like weren't projected to go in that range and have some major flaws to their profile. I, I again, didn't like Mims' film, Jaden Reed. Uh, 
was outproduced as a senior. He's an older prospect. So I'm really happy with Sam Laporta here. I would have probably taken him here even with no tight end premium, if we're being honest, because I think he's the last guy left other than the backup running backs who have a chance to be, you know, a true top 10, top 12 player at the position and garner that future first round draft capital. Cause that that's mostly what I'm doing after the first round in rookie drafts is figuring out who could potentially be worth the first rounder in the future. If, if well, just real were, quick, a quick rebuttal on my man Rice, just real quick, because yeah, know, yeah, go for it. He was playing a whole year with like a broken toe, and that's a pretty bland offense. It doesn't like do a lot of fun, creative stuff. So I got to give him, I got to cut him, my man a little bit of slack. And, and it didn't seem like he was six one. It seemed like he was six five out there. You know what I mean? Oh my god, he. I think that's I, a I have good to give thing, him. You know, I have to give him a lot of credit for that. Like he plays so much bigger than he apparently is. I, yeah. I completely agree with that. Like. If I didn't see the measurements, I thought he'd be, you know, Cedric Tillman size, basically. Yeah. yeah. Um, so I, I agree with that. I'm just worried that he's going to be um, the type of guy in the pros who's just used to really stretch the field, occupy that outside cornerback, and he's not going to get a high enough target volume to really, like, matter. So it, if you had 2-1, two, 2-2, two, 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 and you had the option of Mayor Laporta, what would be your preference? Uh, I I do have Mayor higher. Um, his production profile just dwarfs Laporta's. Um, if I look at my prospect quantitative grades, Mayor's about a 95th percentile prospect. Laporta's in the 87th percentile. So bo- both very good. Um, and I do like Laporta's opportunity better, but I think that Mayor is just likely, less likely to completely bust. Like I see very very little chance that Mayer's not worth the second round pick in two years because yeah. he's just going to see a lot of the field. He has a bunch of, you know, hypothetical upside. I, I think Mayer's a safe pick. And because I know he goes higher, I would definitely take him higher because I want to, you know, get some shares of him. Yeah. Uh, so the athletic score doesn't bother you from Mayer. I, I feel like a lot of people it does. Off, him off, off the list. I mean, it does. Basically, there's been like two top five tight ends in the last seven years who had a relative athletic score below eight and a half. And that's Mark Andrews and Zach Ertz. Um, You could see Mayer kind of pretty good ones there. Yeah, not bad at all. And and you can see Mayer fitting into that that type of mold. Um, I don't think he uh, to be honest, I don't think Laporta has like really like top five tight top three tight end let's say like 16 plus points a game at for tight end premium type upside like a guy like Kittle or Waller but I think both Laporta and Mayer could be a Dallas Goddard type um yeah he, 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 I mean even Zach Ertz like obviously he was you know a top three tight end but he was doing it based off 140 plus targets a season so maybe they could get there if they get in the right situation right you know I I I got Mayer and Laporta pretty close. I'm probably taking yeah. Mayer over Laporta, um, but I like I like I like like we just talked about in your on your first pick. I'm I'm a big proponent of taking tight ends. So, um, and I agree. I think even no premium, I'm I'm to the point where I'd I'd be fine with Laporta in this area as well. So I think that was a I think you got a nice little easy. Was that an easy pick for you right there? Pretty much. It, it was a very easy pick. If 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 my top eighteen were gone, it would have been a very challenging pick. Um, I haven't taken. I think I've taken the two hundred seven in one draft. I've just traded out of it otherwise because I really don't know who I prefer between these late second round guys. Um, but it, it was easy for me where I was at. the The difficult times is when I've been at two hundred five, two hundred six type range, and it's down to like Laporta versus Downs versus Mingo. Th- those are some tighter. Um, arguments that I have to have with myself T- today. I actually had two Oh six in a draft um, and both Laporta and downs were available. So I traded for two Oh seven just so I could take both of them and not have to nice. worry about the <laughs> Yeah, Strong move there. Yeah. Um, so there's no chance you'd trade out of this pick that you would have more likely traded up a little bit to secure, secure who you wanted. Yeah, correct. I, I would take, this pick over honestly over like 211 and 302 like i'm i i think it the draft drops off a little bit of a cliff after 18. all right well i'm excited to see uh who you get in the third round here so. i don't i don't like him <laughs> i don't like <laughs> all him. right I can tell you that all right well we'll catch you in a minute okay <laughs> we're back at 28 with for whom jeff bell tolls is that is that correct for whom Jay Bell tolls. Jay so. Bell tolls. Sorry. Right. I was so close. Um, what was the uh, thought process here at 2-8? 
And who'd you end up going with? So I went with Rasheed Rice here. And so the the thought process on grabbing Rasheed Rice is I think there's a pretty wide tier of wide receivers that really kind of in the secondary market there, these day two wide receivers. But when I look at Rice, I know that the pairing with Patrick Mahomes is there. And so, again, I talked earlier about feeling comfortable with having Quentin Johnson paired to Justin Herbert. I don't know if you can feel any more comfortable with somebody paired with Patrick Mahomes long term. <laughs> and so when you're sitting in that back half of that second round and you see Rasheed Rice there, you're, you're really playing on the odds on having Patrick Mahomes potential primary target moving forward because for as productive as Travis Kelsey is, we know the age there. And so sure. at some point, Travis Kelsey probably will retire from playing football. And so at some point, a new primary target needs to step up for Mahomes. And I know that it, it does feel like there is a fade going on with Rasheed Rice. I think some people decided that he's not particularly that good, maybe, or I don't know what it is, but I think feel, people were feeling burnt after Sky Moore really kind of got pushed up the board last year and kind of, you know, usually he was a middle first round pick last yeah. year and people feeling burnt there. And so I think that they're kind of taking it out on Rasheed Rice a little bit. But um, yeah, I think there's, it's so wide open in that Kansas City offense because for all the struggles of health last year with Juju Smith Schuster, he was very productive through stretches. And so, there is the ability for a second wide receiver to step up opposite Travis Kelsey. We know long-term Tyreek Hill was that receiver for a long time. So I'm just going to throw a dart on a player that is in in an ambiguous situation, able to step up and has a very, very target rich environment. Yeah. I mean, I don't know if you've seen the reception perception on him, but that's pretty much what's buried him for everyone. Cause everyone brings that up 9% success rate on every yeah. route or something or worse than that. And it's like, Oh, well, I guess he could never be any good. Yeah, um, but I, exactly. I, but I, I mean, well, great value there at two nine. We, we, there's not a ton of film to watch on Rasheed Rice, like, especially with the all 22s that we could find, but the, the little that you could find, there was definitely some good spots in there. And, and I don't know that anybody wants any of the context about the, the broken foot that he, he had a broken toe, I believe to begin the year. So, yeah. And, uh, you know, yeah, big it, rice fans over here. I think, I think a couple it's, of things, like you said, I think the public is generally seeming to fade rice and, and, you know, you, you kind of used it as a crux of your argument at one eight and you used it again here at two eight. you know, let's, let's, Let's invest in the good quarterback and, and an offense that we trust, right? Yeah, and I think that sometimes what happens with um, di- playing Dynasty and playing the rookie picks is we we play GM a little bit too actively, and sometimes we just need to say, hey, I, I bet Andy Reid knows a lot about football, and I think that the people that are doing things with the Super Bowl champion Kansas City Chiefs know a little bit about football, and so if I'm going to get a target with Patrick Mahomes, I'm going to go ahead and and not – you know, over evaluate to the nth degree on if I'm deciding if Rasheed Rice is a good football player or not. I'm going to kind of lean on the NFL there a little bit too. Sure. Um, so what would be the player that would move you off Rice that may have been drafted before him? Like a Mingo, a Downs, a Spears, is there Laporta? If they were still there, who would have taken you off that Rice pick? If there's a, a premium here, um, one of these tight yeah, ends, Mayor or Mayor yeah. Laporta, yeah, I mean Mayor yeah. Laporta, I think that you got those guys that, I mean, it's it's because they were second round picks. It's easy to forget they were almost first round picks, and they were almost <laughs> sure. first round pick tight ends, and so uh, they were a couple just fell right into the second round there. So if I grab one of those guys, I feel very very good through that second round. Um, maybe a Charbonnet is going to go earlier than that. Um, mm-hmm. Maybe a Kendra Miller. Might I feel might feel a little bit more comfortable grabbing running back in that position, but um, if I'm rolling the dice here on a wide receiver, I see some other wide receivers that have gone before or gone after him, right after him, and um, I, I don't know. I feel a lot better rolling the dice on again a Patrick Mahomes potential primary target long term. Is that what keeps you off of Mims? You're you're scared about the pecking order and and the quarterback. I know a lot of people really like Mims. He did fall. Uh, further than I anticipated him following with this group of guys here. Uh, um, I, I think I, I think Mims steps into a very limited role in the New Orleans or in that not New Orleans. Uh, I mean, Freudian flip there in the Denver yeah. offense, because um, I think 
initially he profiles into kind of the role that Ted Ginn or Traquan Smith held. And I understand why people are very excited for him, but he was really only a vertical threat in college. And so you're asking for a lot of development for a player who really didn't show that underneath game or that intermediate game that really leads to a lot of volume at the NFL level, especially for PPR formats to develop that game at the NFL level. And he didn't show it at college. And yes, the explosive plays are fantastic. And Russell Wilson, if they're able to protect, if they're able to rely on the run game and attack vertically off play action, I think Mims can have moments, but I think that you're really chasing unpredictable production on that profile right now. And I understand why the advanced stats like him so much because he was very productive in those deep shots and that led to high efficiency across the board. But again, I think that Sean Payton's offense, they have pretty established roles for the receivers and I feel pretty comfortable about why they drafted him, what he's going to do. And and you're kind of projecting on growth that he didn't show at the college level to feel like he's going to feel like a, a top 24 wide receiver long-term. Yeah. Strong, strong mim slander there. I like it. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I've got right, Mims, but again, like these, some of these guys, it's, it's, I loaded up on those early thirds as much as I could. And, and really, if I had like later thirds and I did everything I could to load up in that, with like the 304 in my mind was kind of the drop off point. And so I did grab Mims um, early third in a couple of leagues. And so I have some exposure to Mims, but I mean, that, that was a price that I felt comfortable at. Yeah. And I, you know, I think what you were saying with kind of after uh, I might put it a little, a little couple more windows on that, but after 110 kind of being comfortable through, but most of the second around, I feel like is pretty interchangeable. And I don't think there is, I think there's a consensus of guys who go from 111 to three, five ish, but they're not really in too much of an order per se. So outside of maybe premium with the tight ends, I feel you. And I, I, I kind of like that, uh, that premise there and, and feeling comfortable and not getting, terribly picky with this guy over that guy but uh you know you you maybe did throw your gm cap a little bit more on with the mims there uh and i like it i like it um so excited to see who uh who you got at three eight so we'll see you then all right so we're back with scott connor at the two nine spot what Real quick in here. Where can we find you, uh, Scott? Find all my work. Well check my Twitter. There's a link to everything. <laughs> but my two podcasts are on Destination Devi. One airs on Fridays, one airs or Saturdays, and one airs on Mondays. Uh, and then we have a YouTube channel, Dynasty Trades in Five. We live stream every Tuesday night at 8.30, talking strategy, trades, whatnot. Those are the two main places to find my content and then just some other random stuff. But those are the two main things. And who's Charles? Charles is me. That's my middle name. I go by I go by Scott, but I got the nickname Charles and I was the most chill, I guess, when I was a kid. So they said, hey, Charles, chill, and it stuck. All right. So a lot of mysteries. Uh, as long as it wasn't a self-given here. nickname, then it's good. <laughs> nope. <laughs> All right. What do you what do you got with the 2-9 here? I was surprised this player was there at the 2-9, uh, just given where I've seen him go in other drafts. Uh, this seemed to be a draft where some people ahead of me liked receivers with... I don't want to say bad profiles, but I think they reached based on the draft capital for the receiver. We had obviously Jonathan Mingo go 203, Josh Downs 205, Rasheed Rice 208, which means it pushed Roshan Johnson to me running back seven at the 209. I'm a very huge advocate of process, and this was the perfect draft to hit on running backs in the second round, early third round in Superflex. Uh, Didn't have as many running backs drafted this year as I think a lot of people expected, but the ones that did round three, round four, uh, that's essentially like the new round two, round three from years past. That's how the NFL treats it. I think Roshan's a great pick here, especially if you have a build like I probably do. We're not doing this with like team context, but I probably have a build of a hero RB, maybe two reliable running backs and the rest are... I need as many bodies that could give me startable weeks as possible. So I would prefer him over all of the receivers that went in the second round, including a couple of them that got drafted ahead of him here. And then Josh Downs went in the third. So uh, not that those were mistakes. I would just take the running back here, whether it was Roshan. If he was gone, I would have taken Tank Bigsby. Yeah. Any any RB on the 53. I think that's it. That's what you uh, You got it. Yeah. You got it. Um, so no, no thoughts of, of Mims here or, or, or tank. 
No, because I can live with missing out on second or third round receivers. I think we're going to look back in this class in a year or two and say one of maybe two of Downs, Mingo, Rice, Reed, Mims, Hyatt, Tillman. Maybe two of those guys ended up better than probably what their draft cost or their capital said. But I bet you four or five of them go by the wayside to where, you know, they're the next Rondale Moore or Terrace Marshall where you're just like, okay, they're occupying a roster spot, but they probably don't really have a lot of equity in terms of what they're giving me. They're just there. The the value to them would be the value someone else sees in their league where I could maybe flip them for a different position or a future pick. So I just don't want to bet. I'll buy back in. My theory on the 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 round two and round three receivers is I'll wait. Wait to see which ones are good or which ones are just better than what we thought. Then I think you can buy those guys. Maybe not cheap, but you can buy them. They're available. You right. know, because like, they're... Like Jahan well, Dotson right now is still attainable. And I think we've got enough information to tell me that I think he's good enough. Or, or is that not, not really what you're thinking? No, that... And that's part of the the community didn't love him despite being right. in a first round pick. I mean, in the he scored too many touchdowns, right? I mean, you can't right. be scoring that many touchdowns because you'll never be able to do that again. And then the right. that means you're not good, I think. Is that hurt it. That went against him because it was like, right. oh, it's a fluke. So right. it's like he's being discounted, even though he was a first round pick. But then you have a couple guys in here that people don't really love, like someone like Jalen Hyatt, for instance. I didn't love him, but if he ends up just being different than what a lot of people said he's going to be. I feel like there will be buyback opportunities because what will you hear? Ah, oh, man, he's a third round pick. Like se- you'll hear a lot of people saying, sell him. If you can sell him for a late first next year, sell him because he was a late second this year. You can buy in on those guys because they didn't have the pedigree. If I always make the example of like Rashad Bateman versus Amon Ra St. Brown. Mm-hmm. If Rashad Bateman would have put up Amon Ra St. Brown numbers, unattainable the next year. But Amon Ra was a fourth rounder, so you still had people saying, "Ah, man, if you can get a on him, yeah, yeah, if you can get a first, if you can get a first in a player, like you got to cash out on this guy. Like you're, it's betting against the probability if you're going to him have him continue on going with with what he was doing his rookie year. So maybe in Pierce, I think maybe. You, you can buy back in. You can yeah. buy back in on guys like Mims or yeah. Downs or whatever when they hit. So I'm okay passing. What would have been uh, the player left that went before? Uh, Two nine that would have made you change your pick here. Like would it Mingo Laporta. Spears La- <laughs> Laporta? <laughs> I mean, Kendra making it there would be absurd. In yeah, my he's opinion. not making it there. Yeah, it probably would have been Kendra. And honestly, I think in a lot of drafts you would have seen Tajay Spears go after Roshan Johnson, maybe yeah. even Tank Bigsby. I, I might have taken Spears if those other two would have gone, just because I don't. I really don't care about a running back's health more than a year or two down the road. Like I'm not looking, oh man, if he retires in 2028, I'm screwed. Yeah. Like he's, he's replaced by 2028 on my roster and probably in the NFL. So yeah, I think it would have just been whatever running back was there. I would have taken, I would have taken Kendra Miller and Charbonnet over Roshan Johnson. So, so, so to foreshadow a little bit here, is that, do you have a, are you prioritizing prioritizing the running back or a position in a rookie draft or this year's class yes because there were a lack of receiver options that got pedigree uh outside of the top four guys uh and then in a lot of rookie drafts i'm typically using my second and third round picks to either trade out for future picks so that i can buy running backs during the season or just draft running backs like the ones that are on the board right now i i think my one mistake just for the listeners one of the mistakes i think i've made over the last two years is i've actually drafted too many running backs in this range only because it's like, man, I'm, I'm taking, that? well, because I'm picking them with second round picks, yet you get into the season. If if we're drafting guys like Roshan Johnson or Tajay Spears as they're still pretty short window bets, right? They're day three running backs or late day two running backs. There's a pretty good chance that there's another player similar to them that joins them at some point in their career the next year or two. Mm-hmm. Even if they keep their role, it's not there's like it's going to prohibit it. There's a threat. There's always a threat. So I'm looking at these as like one to two year window plays. But what happens if I didn't make a bunch of late second round picks and just kicked the pick to the future, waited till the season got here and waited till somebody goes, oh man, I, I can't 
keep Deontay Foreman or Jamal Williams or someone like that. And they're just give, they'll give two guys away like that for a one single second, because man, they're an old running back. That's been around for five years. I might've just stolen six to eight usable weeks, which is essentially what I'm hoping if I draft Roshan Johnson, right? Like I'm hoping there's a window of time. You can also see where where you're at at that point in the season, whether it's correct, you know, Going if I don't need it, capital, right? Then you hang on. I hold the pick exactly, or yeah, you buy flexible. into, or you buy into one of those receivers that you were talking about. Who, hey, maybe I'll take these two twos and buy one of these receivers that you want to buy back in. Who, you know, maybe the the public opinion isn't isn't quite come back around on or come around on rather. So I like Get that. Burned on the uh, Zamir Whites, Isaiah Spillers. You know that that these were the guys going in this range last year. Terry yeah. and Davis Price. You know, man, what do you do with those guys now? It's like they're. A tier below Tank Bigsby and Roshan Johnson is what? Right. A, a, an active body. You hope you, he makes your roster. So. Yeah. All right. We're back at 210 uh, with Mason from the uh, Flock Network there. Make sure you check him out. Uh, at 210, what were you thinking here and what was the pick? Yeah, here it was actually a tough call for me. I, I mean, Roshan Johnson went right before. I'm a big Roshan guy. I would have loved to grab a running back with a potential three down skill set here in the second, but we don't is that get bias. Him. Is that hometown bias? Uh, it, it may, in, maybe it's it? a little bit of a hometown bias. I'm not going to deny that, but I was kind of sitting here and going back and forth between Marvin Mims and Jaden Reed. I honestly have Mims as a better prospect. I mean, Mims checks a lot of the boxes that we look for. He broke out as a freshman. He dominated as a sophomore. He declared as a junior and he got decent NFL draft capital going in round two. The reason I decided to go read here at the end of the day is just because the landing spot is significantly better in Green Bay where Mims is going to be competing with a handful of wide receivers in Denver, which is probably going to be a pretty bad passing offense. With Reed, on the other hand, you really just have him going up against Christian Watson. I think is a real shot to play over Romeo Dobbs, I mean, by halfway through his rookie season. And he does have some strong marks on his profile as well. I mean, he breaks out as a freshman. He does dominate as a junior. The one red flag that I'm seeing similar to Zay Flowers is this is a player that's actually staying all four years, which, as we've already discussed, I don't love to see. But he does get round two NFL draft capital as well, which, I mean, historically speaking, has been a sweet spot for some of these wide receivers and rookie drafts. So it was between Mims, Reed, I'm going to go read given the situation, but I could see myself in another rookie draft possibly going Mims. Yeah, that's interesting. I feel like a lot of people would would favor the Denver situation over the Green Bay situation because of the coach, the the quarterback, the the system potentially where we have no idea what's going to happen with with Green Bay and where they're going. So you have faith and love. I mean, I don't necessarily want to sit here and act like I know Jordan Love's going to be a great quarterback, but I know if, I don't know if Russell Wilson's a great quarterback. That's, I mean, we just saw fair. Russell Wilson be a bottom three guy this past yeah. year. So it's not fair. that I believe in Jordan Love. It's that I, I don't know who Jordan Love is, but I also don't know who Russell Wilson is. Yeah. I want to say Russell was still like QB 18 last year. Like I mean, performance wise of, of an actual not. Not not fantasy perspective. Yeah. Like, well, the, he's got. If there's job security, it's Russell Wilson because, <laughs> like, they're bringing in coaches to make it work with Russell Wilson, which they got a banger of one, and it seems like a lot's changing there. Um, you mentioned Jaden Reed being there four years. He's actually like he he transferred from I think Western Michigan and then had to sit out in 2019, so he's like an extra year yeah older. Um, and then there's some like I was trying to get the specifics on it, um, but the. It, some people are concerned about the amount of contested targets uh, that, that come a player's way, like a percentage of targets, because that's why Nikhil Harry wasn't any good is because he had too many contested targets, which I, you know, watching the tape on Jaden Reed, like he, he seems like he's pretty good in that proud. Like he's only 5'11", but he plays bigger than that. And he's going up doing work in the contested area. But like, is he is he not getting enough separation? Is like, is that at all a concern for you? Or if someone can go through and show me the correlation of contested catches in college targets to contested targets in college to fantasy football production at the next level, then it will be a concern for me. But until <laughs> someone shows me that data and can actually illustrate that it does matter, it's I'm going to stick with what I know matters. And he checks some of the boxes that I like. Gotcha. Fair enough. All right. Well, uh, was there, there's no other hookers, not a consideration. Hyatt's not a consideration. There's, 
Hinton Hooker actually was a consideration. Jalen Hyatt definitely wasn't. If Hyatt went round one of the NFL draft, it'd be a little bit different. Sure. If I was going to be looking at a non-wide receiver here, it would have been Hinton Hooker. I, I don't necessarily think Hooker is going to be any good, right? I mean, historically speaking, if you're looking at his draft capital, if you're looking at a couple different other marks, he most likely isn't any good, right? He most likely never even starts for an NFL team. However, Given the rushing upside, if he were to turn into a starting quarterback, I mean, Hooker does have the ceiling where you kind of have to consider him here, right? But it was just more so, I mean, um, let, let's go ahead and let's get a wide receiver that could possibly make an impact right away and possibly be a ca- candidate to flip at a higher price tag halfway through his rookie year. Is that your main uh, goal in the any draft or specifically rookie drafts? Or are you just looking for the value that can be turned into something maybe – or is that maybe just outside of round one? That's the most thing that you're looking for. Is it the whole draft that you, you want to you're looking for the best possible quickest flip? Not necessarily the quickest flip, but I mean, if we're thinking about how dynasty fantasy football is played, it's nice to sit here and pretend like, yeah, I'm going to draft this guy and I'm going to have him for 10 years. Right. Mm-hmm. In reality, sure. everybody pulls up their dynasty team and probably looks at it every single day, you yeah. know, we're going to get to next off season and we're going to be sitting with these guys on our roster for six months. And if I can take someone who I think has a shot at being worth more in that six month time period where I'm possibly able to go through and look to trade them at an elevated price, it's definitely something that I would like to see, obviously. So would if if let's say Rice was still available, would would Rice be in a conversation here for you or is he out? I would have taken Rice. I, I think uh, okay. Reed's probably the better player, but if you're looking at Rice with the potential to just vault up to being the number one wide receiver in Kansas City, obviously not the number one pass catcher, but the number one wide receiver, even if he's not as strong of a prospect, but yeah, hell yeah, I'll go ahead and I'll take him. All right, last one. Mingo or Downs here, do you take or either one of those over those guys? I would take Downs. I am probably lower on Mingo than anybody else you're going to find. So, no, I, I would not take Jonathan Mingo. I don't even have Jonathan Mingo ranked in my top 24. I, I've, I've been just curiously taking everybody's temperature of Mingo because I, I have a hard time really placing him. It seems like anything after this middle of the second, I'm OK with like, I'll take a shot. Could be an opportunity there. Um, but no, I'm, I'm with you. I'm, I'm probably a little further down. And then some people are kind of 50 50 on down since he didn't get the capital. But you're still you're still down plus. You know, Anthony Richardson, unsure of the quarterback position a little bit there of, of, of some people. I'm a big Anthony Richardson guy. Um, does Downs scare you at all now? Well, I mean, if you look at Josh Downs, I mean, I think it was the expectation that he was going to go at least late round two, early round three. Because if you were looking at the Downs profile in particular, this is someone that's not going to be a field stretching option for his mm-hmm. NFL team. This is not someone that's going to be able to actually go through and impact the way that the defensive coordinator has to deploy the safeties. Of course. Sure. So naturally, he's one of these guys that has a lower real life value than fantasy football value. And that with Jalen Hyatt, for instance, who goes in the same round, Hyatt can actually be a quote unquote hit for the Giants and still not be any good for our fantasy teams, where the only 100%. way Josh Downs is a hit for the Colts is he's phenomenal from a fantasy football perspective. I mean, this is why, like, you should have been higher on Amon Ross St. Brown than just his NFL draft capital where he goes in round four. Because, yeah, he's maybe not as valuable as what you have with some speedster wide receivers in that draft going in. Of course, now we know it's a little bit of a different story. But generally, the NFL is going to push down those slot wide receivers operating closer to the line of scrimmage, where those are going to be the guys actually scoring fantasy points. And the NFL is going to be pushing up speedy wide receivers that are going to stretch NFL defenses, where they're usually going to help their NFL offenses, but not really help our fantasy teams. I feel like there's probably some historical data to prove that fourth round wide receivers are never going to be any good as well. Right. <laughs> oh yeah, no, definitely. Yeah. I mean, if you look back, Amon Ross and Brown definitely breaks the mold, but yeah, on that note, what's actually pretty funny is in my wide receiver model, if a wide receiver is too fast, we actually um, hurt him. Like, like he actually scores hurt lower him. because what will inherently happen is if you're John Ross, if you're Henry Ruggs, I mean, if you're going out there and just blazing at the 40 yard dash, it will skew your NFL draft capital because an NFL team will go through and take you for the field stretching ability, which will never convert to actual fantasy football production. So yeah, it's kind of funny that like our model props up these guys that maybe are falling in NFL drafts because of the lack of verticality to their game and negatively impacts those guys that are going to stretch the field. Yeah, it's good. Good stuff there. All right, let's uh, let's get out of this pick. We'll see you at 310. 211 back with Jax Falcone 
Good to see you again. Yeah. Uh, you got another another good pick here. I feel like you got somebody who maybe fell to you. I don't know how you feel about it, but uh, who is the pick and what were you thinking leading up to it? <laughs> Hell yeah, man. I mean, Marvin Mims at the 211. I was like, you know, just watching, you know, the, the whole like second round go. And for me, Marvin Mims is early second round. Um, he is m- my wide receiver uh, five in this draft. So after Zay Flowers, and probably closer to Zay Flowers than the other guys. I really like Marvin Mims. There's probably a maybe a one year sort of wait time till he's sort of fully integrated. You know, the profile was outstanding. Um, you know, and so yeah, I was pretty psyched to get Marvin Mims at the two eleven for sure. Yeah, I, w- I was kind of shocked with with this group and and some of the guys who were in here that that it that he fell that late, and he yeah. seems to actually be falling a little later than I expected in a lot of drafts because. You know, pre-draft that he he was heating up from the dynasty community, it seemed, but maybe not the NFL community, and then got pretty good capital for and and a pretty good landing spot. Yet, like you said, you may have to deal with Sutton or Judy, but both of those guys had rumored outs and maybe aren't really those. You know, Sean Mc Sean Sean McVay, uh, Sean Payton's <laughs> guy, um, one or the other. I mean, I, I like Judy and and Sutton really. Um, yeah. I but, think people aren't ready to buy into Russell Wilson, even though Peyton's there. True that. I think they just really hate Russell, which it's easy to hate Russell, but it's like to me, it seems easy to turn that thing right around as well. Yeah. <clears throat> so I mean, Russell Wilson, I uh I forget who I was talking to. Oh, Scott Barrett. And it was like Russell Wilson is like it's this year or bust. That's the sort of the word from Denver. It's like if mm-hmm. he doesn't do it this year, it's over for Russell Wilson in Denver. And uh I think he's a post June first. Uh, cut for next year mm-hmm. um he, his salary is huge but i think they're able to get out reasonably after uh, post june 1st um so again if it doesn't happen maybe next year it's a whole different situation there in denver you're right sutton might be traded it's possible they love tim patrick i think i think jerry judy's going to be you know sort of the slot flanker and and mims man he could step right into to, to more role for me mims is like you know when i was doing my pre-draft stuff I was like, why is Mims not the guy? I, I couldn't figure it out. I mean, this is a guy who was an early declare, which we all we all want early declare uh, wide receivers in rookie drafts. If you don't mm-hmm. know, now you know. And you know, <laughs> you want guys who broke out early. That's what you want. Well, he has a he has an eighteen year old breakout age. He was one of the you know one of the more dominant younger wide receivers in this class. His draft capital wasn't great, but it was Sean Payton's first pick as a Denver Bronco head coach, and he right. traded up to get him. Um, he's done that with uh, Brandon Cooks and others, um, and I think he's going to really enjoy Mr. Marvin Mims on his team. And look, for whatever Russell Wilson's uh, issues are, it isn't throwing deep. Uh, no. At least that's been his you know claim to fame. So Marvin Mims gains separation in the deep, deep uh, quadrants of the field. Uh, Matt Harmon. Reception perception really, really liked Marvin Mims as well, um, which is another, you know, reason that I'm in, Um, you know, so all for all those reasons, uh, you know, Scott Barrett having Marvin Mims as his pre-draft wide receiver to Matt Harmon, loving him and reception perception and my dynasty, uh, you know, uh, anatomy series, loving Marvin Mims as well for a lot of the uh, data points that you see, plus the film, plus his high school, uh, Mm -hmm. you know, uh, dominance. He's one of the more dominant uh, players in Texas high school history. I think he is the most dominant wide receiver uh, in high school history in Texas. I hear Texas has a long, I, you got to look into this, but it might be a, a football uh, state. Yeah. Uh, you might yeah. want to check into that. <laughs> Not sure if they have anybody there. Um, so yeah, there's around. a lot of sort of things that have, that have, you know, he went to a big time school dominated right away. So for all those reasons, dude, he was, did you, did you Marvin Mims for his career, in uh, college, 19.5 yards per catch for his yeah, career in college. That's quite a number there. I mean, it's like too much for people almost, which I thought they liked the yards per catch. But some people are like, that. that's too many. He doesn't do anything intermediate. So he's just going to so, be an occupying the corner down the field and he's never going to get any play. That's which, what we thought. And then and then the Matt Harmon stuff made me feel a little bit better because, you know, obviously he charts all the different routes and he was his success rate on on multiple routes was very, very good. So. For those reasons, I am all in, uh, and especially with a mid to late second round pick, which, you know, 
they don't always come through anyway. But if right. you're going to catch lightning in a bottle, this is the type of player to do it with. Yeah, I yeah. would have him ahead of, you know, just to look at the, the the draft board. You know, I'm taking him ahead of Mingo. I'm taking ahead of Downs. I'm taking ahead of Rashi Rice. I'm certainly taking him ahead of Tajay Spears. So for me, all the way through, you know, I love Jaden Reed, the, the pick that went right in front of me. That's another guy. So Jaden Reed is my wide receiver six. So Reed and Mims going late like that. I've got them well ahead of everybody else. Perfect. That was, you know, you read my mind again. That was the follow up. So I like, I like that. Um, yeah, no, I, I like Mims. I have Mims in a similar spot as well. Um, I think, I think the fact that he does have vertical prowess, it gives them something that they don't really have uh, on that roster right now. I mean, right. maybe, you know, I don't remember exactly what Tim Patrick's forte was, uh, but Mims seems like he could come right in there. And, and, you know, I think Peyton's good at, at getting vertical receivers open um, and, and Russell Wilson with those, moon balls uh if he can get protection and move around a little bit is is certainly uh very good at connecting with those we've seen that time after time as a, as a Niners fan he has gutted me uh more than once uh that that damn I, I mean it was nice to see Russell Wilson SD this year because uh he <laughs> really killed me for a while and um, he's a real son of a bitch you're right just um, stop being so hey. big fat phony hey as the as uh I think Mike Lombardi coined this one they're an injury away from being a good team. All they have to do is get Jared Stidham out in the field. We saw what he can do. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, but w- one interesting thing that we've kind of talked about a little bit is, is Russell Wilson's like positivity guru guy that's been with him forever, like passed away right before the season started last year. And oh, that's it. Like Ryan Le- Leaf has given this guy a lot of credit for turning his life around. And he meets with some of these bigger programs and, he said, you know, that, that that is something that could be it's such a thing in Russell Wilson's life that it, it could have been something that, you know, did that he didn't talk about that that negatively affected him. Now there's a million other things that he didn't do well. But, you know, sometimes there is, you know, you're going through personal shit and it can leak into some other things. Um, so I, I did some quick research here on the on the uh, the post one June one designation cut. And basically, if there's some options they can exercise where it converts salary into signing bonus. And they can do a, a post June one cut, which would still be a thirty five million dollar dead cap hit in twenty four and a forty nine million dollar dead cap hit in twenty five. But with the option, it, it basically cuts the cap hit in more than half of what it would be otherwise. Right. So plus it's, they got it's Walmart manageable. money. They don't give a fuck. Yeah, but <laughs> Walmart money doesn't change the cap. But I mean, I guess it does. I guess it's it's all the cap's fake anyways. You just convert shit into signing bonuses if you have the money to spend it. And yeah. they definitely have they got Walmart money. So like they own Walmart, not like they're shopping right. at Walmart. Right. <laughs> not like they're Tracy Morgan and got hit by a Walmart truck. Yeah. <laughs> um at two eleven, yeah. uh, Mims falls there and you're excited about it. But if if you know Mims goes two five or whatever, are you trying to get out of that two eleven? Is two eleven still a spot that you're interested in or just because yeah, it fell this question. way for you? I think, um, yeah, a lot of times Jaden Reed or Marvin Mims will fall. I was just in a draft um, today where I had the 208 and the 211, interestingly enough. And uh, Jaden Reed was off the board and Mims was going to go 27. I traded the 28 and the 211 for the 27 and uh, 33 or something like that. So, mm-hmm. you know, yeah, I want to make sure I get him if I can. If not, I'd rather trade back. I think there's a little bit of a flat tier there, maybe. Um, you know, I do like Laporta a bit. I actually like Musgrave, and mm-hmm. he's been available in that mid third. Yeah, I mean, three six here. There it is. I mean, yeah. he's available. So for Spoiler me, alert. I really like to move back. So if I'm at the two eleven, if I can move back and get something, you know, maybe a two three. Uh, I've done this a couple times. I've done like a late second. Someone wants to move up for somebody that I don't like as much, maybe a Tajay Spears or who knows what. I'll move back from the 211 into the third round and then switch 24, third and seconds. Yeah, that's the 2-3 swap. Love the 2-3 swap. Right. So, you know, look, it could – I'm only moving from late second to early third. It could be early second to late third next year potentially. I don't know. You know, who knows, right? right? So it could be a much bigger move next year. Also, I'm more likely to like the second round in 2024 just because this second – look, this second round is not that good. I mean, we know that. I mean, think about past second rounds, what the type of players you were getting. Jalen Waddle was going in the friggin' second round. T. Higgins, Michael Pittman, there were a lot of good players going in the second rounds of drafts, Brandon Ayuk, et cetera. Um, 
I don't know if we're going to Denzel see Mims. I mean, geez, that guy was awesome. Uh, he was going first round with me. I love <laughs> Denzel Mims. A complete L. Maybe that's why Marvin's getting pushed. He's getting his brother's it is. shit over here. You know, that's why Quentin Johnson's going down too. It's the uh, I we call it the uh, the the PTCU SD PTCUSD. That's it. And what P- did that say for? PTSD but from TCU, right? Oh, okay. PTCU. <laughs> <All right. laughs> Spit that one out. Yeah, I, I, I kind of like that. You know, if, if, if I see that the back half of that second isn't trending to some guys that I necessarily like, I, I don't hate the three one to three six range. Yep. Really, if I can get, if I can move back a little and gain a second for next year to throw around mid season, if I, you know, need if I'm playing well and want to try to move up or, Bingo. you know get another a player to compete with or, or just hang on until next draft season. Um, yep. Like being uh, fluid there. So yeah, uh, I've Jackson, done that on a number of occasions. Yeah. I love it. Yeah. Tell, tell us where we can uh, find all your, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Tell us this. Let me Content paraphernalia. take that again. Paraphernalia. Oh shit. You gotta that. come to my house for the paraphernalia, brother. <laughs> I'll take that again. Let's go. California. Memorabilia. That was confusing. Memorabilia. Too. Shit. That's in a closet <laughs> somewhere. That's locked up. I mean, memorabilia, paraphernalia, but my content you can find on Twitter at Dino Game Theory, at Dino Game Theory, uh, theundroppables.com, and, of course, my awesome podcast, The Undrafted. You find it where podcasts are found. All right, the end of the second round. We're back Ooh, with two more. Our, our main man, Casey. <laughs> Case Cam. Uh, extenuating circumstances were remote today, so... Uh, my alleged, my uh, prestigious guest. What uh, were you thinking here at two twelve? Seem like uh, based on hearing everybody's feedback, uh, having done this draft, you know, a couple weeks ago now at this point, because it takes a while to wrangle all these guys, schedule them, record sure. with them, edit it on my end, you know. So you have some time to to think back, and you know, everyone was like, I don't know if any of your picks, except for maybe Will Levis. Would have made it to you based on how everybody was talking about those. You know, everybody was actually, I hate tooting your horn, but they were, they were, they liked <laughs> your picks there. Um, yeah. So what were you thinking at 212? Pretty, pretty excited um, to get this player, huh? Yeah. I mean, again, I feel like these picks are kind of falling to me. I wasn't too upset about Will Levis. That's, it seems like a good pick. And then 212, again, Tank Bigsby is sitting right there in my lap. Um, you know, this that, that I'd probably am, am staying neutral here if it's my pick and I'm not not really trying to move up. I'm not really trying to move back. I like the way this draft was falling. I knew it seemed like, a, you know, I was, I was going to get somebody good. And then especially once Jaden Reed pops off the board, I'm like, all right, well, I'm locked into Mims or, or Bigsby uh, making my life really easy here uh, and, and taking Tank Bigsby. And like you said, everybody, you know, everybody's already clamoring for some Bigsby. Uh, so, you know, it, it's it's great value. It's it gives me a, ability to trade. I was already a big fan of Tank Bigsby coming into this, uh, had him ranked fairly high. And now, you know, we're going to do some shows here coming up on on ETN and and Tank and Kenny Walker and uh, Charbonnet. Uh, so, you know, everybody, everybody is ready to hate. Travis Etienne, so Tanks Bigsby is the flavor of the month, and and you know, really after we got out of this draft and the way everybody feels about this, Tank Bigsby would probably be on the move for me. Uh, honestly, you know, I I I I like Tank. I think he's going to have a nice little role on a team, but maybe maybe getting uh, overvalued now a little bit. And you know, again, like the player, but I, I think Etienne's a really good player. I I don't know why you needed a blurb from. Uh, sleeper to tell you that that they didn't want to use one guy and feature him like if you were actually watching football and paying attention or have ever watched Doug Peterson like that's what he wanted to do and that's what he was gonna do and then he went right back like he traded for hasty and he they went and picked uh who's a dude from the Browns last that was um DeForest uh uh, Dearness Johnson. Uh, so, so he he's also there, who I think is is a nice backup, who's a little older. Um, so, you know, they're gonna rotate those guys, and and so I, I, maybe even it would be a sell before the season even starts for Tank Bigsby here. That make that's a great point. Although I would probably want to keep him and then draft Clayton Tune later in the fourth, and then I could change my team name to Clayton Bigsby. <laughs> you know, Clayton Bigsby's. Uh, if you yeah. have hate me in the park later, that. <laughs> yeah, smash strange. Yeah. Been yeah. a lot of strange uh, smashing this go around. All right. Well, yeah, that pretty much fell to you. Uh, good job, buddy. 
<laughs> you didn't consult me on these picks. You just did it. No. Uh, yeah. I mean, it's, 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 uh, that, that was like, like I said, this is, this has been a pretty easy draft so far. Um, and, uh, you know, thank keep, keep the blurbs coming and, and keep dropping the ETN price, I guess. Cause sure. you know, I wasn't paying the ETN price beforehand, but if, if, if all, you know, all the, there's a lot of big accounts out there giving some Bigsby love, which I'm pretty sure those guys weren't huge Bigsby guys beforehand. Did uh, you know that like too many of them didn't have, doesn't um, have lateral agility. Did you know? know you yeah. That. He's big. He's going to come in and right away and take short yardage goal line and all the pass catching work. And I'm like, all of that, he's just going to take it all Damn. forever. Like, yeah. Wow. Like, I okay. like Bigsby, but I, you know, I think, ETA, and then, but ETA was really, you know, efficient on ETA. the metrics. He was like one of the most efficient rushers. So I don't, I don't know what anybody likes or dislikes anymore, but he's a, he's a bad pass catcher, I guess. So everybody, you know, which he, just like me, you got all these stats and metrics and then you get to spin them however you want based on how you like the player, you know? Right. And, and I list, listen, ETN isn't the most natural pass catcher, but I, he was basically a rookie last year. Uh, because he had a fucking injured foot the entire if season. If he wouldn't have dropped that touchdown, and, I feel like it'd be a different narrative. You I know, mean, there, like, were, there were there were a couple where you're like, "Damn, Etn!" Like, you know, you could, uh, maybe, but again, a really hardworking guy. He changed the narrative one time on you a little bit, and then people came back and said, "Well, you know, not really." But he really he changed it from non pass catcher at all to like, "Hey, we got to consider it." To hey, this is my first year in the league, basically. Well, he missed his rookie year, and then Urban Meyer was a schmohawk. Yeah, and you you got Doug Peterson. So like, you know, he's it, he's. It, He's going to be in a rotation just like every other running back in the fucking league, and ATN's going to fucking hit home runs and still catch some passes. So Yeah, I think it's uh, probably a good thing for him to get a breather. And, I mean, if we go back to when ETA, ATN was getting drafted, he was, like, considered a really good wide receiver at that point or ca- pass catcher at that point because of how many balls he caught his senior year at Clemson. And, and if you go back all the way to, like, his freshman year, he couldn't catch anything. And he right. worked throughout college to become a prolific college pass catcher out of the backfield. Yeah, and, and, and I think there was some people who were saying, like, yeah, the numbers are good, but it's it's not great on film. And I, and I can I can say, that yes, I, I mostly agree with that, but he's, he's changed – he ch- at least ha- changed that narrative already once. Um, yeah, and where, does, where you had to at least be like, hey, I can't not consider the pass catching at this point, even if it's not the most natural thing in the world. And again, hardworking guy, like you just said, and I, you know, he's just going to continue to get better uh, at, at all of those things. Uh, right, coming so. off of a of Liz Frank fracture, didn't even know if he was going right. to come back with that same explosiveness, and he definitely has that explosiveness. So, but I'll take all the tank and yeah. trade him, trade him to. Uh, the ETN haters. Uh, All right. You know, love so. it. All right. We'll see you at 312. Cool. Oh, Jesus. Get rid of it. <laughs> well, that'll wrap round two. Stay tuned for round three and four. Make sure you hit that like, like subscribe button. Hit that little notey. Should drop the following day. Uh, a lot of fun, a lot of strategy talk. Really, really appreciate all the guys that came on here and, and, and gave us their time and chit chatted with us. Uh, that was a lot of fun, a lot of work, a ton of work. I'm beat. Uh, but we appreciate y'all for joining us. Make sure you give us a five-star review if you're listening on the podcast, iTunes or Spotify, and head over to patreon.com slash EFF Dynasty. We got extra shows. We got ADP. We got Discord channel, all kinds of fun. Get your questions answered, uh, and we, we appreciate y'all for joining us. And, again, shout-out to all the guys that did join us for this uh, for this industry mock. That was, that was a ton of fun. Too much work. I don't know if we'll do it again next year, but, uh, you know, this will live forever. So uh, we appreciate yeah. y'all, and we'll see you next time. Peace.